Dumela Kara. Dumela. How are you doing? I am so good. Thank you for having you, you me. You know, I'm sitting here and I'm looking. Kibati Lekiri, your TV. <laughs> <laughs> you and the entire country. You know? It's so crazy. So many years later. I'm from Etridgeville in Pretoria. That's where I was born. Okay. And then grew up a little bit in Soshanguve. So definitely from Pretoria. Okay. My mom moved to Johannesburg in the early 90s. Mm. So then that's where I think most of my upbringing has happened. But yes, a Pretoria girl raised in uh, Johannesburg by a single mom. But then something unique happened with you. I mean, you started waking... Mm. <laughs> 10 years. Yeah. And you know what's so crazy? I always tell people that I start counting from about 10, 11. Yeah. Because if I start counting earlier, it's too many years. Like, you're not going to believe me that at 32 years old, I've been working for so many years. Because actually what happened was I was doing ads, TV mm. ads and stuff like that already from the time I was about two, three years old. Mm. And then your TV happened when I was 10 going on, on to 11. Mm. So I always say my career is 20 years old, but to be quite honest, it's happened since I was a toddler. My mom would enter me in baby competitions, baby mm. smiling competitions, mm. and I'd win clothes, I'd win money, and then she had a friend for who was smiling. like... smiling? Just for smiling. I've been smiling all my life. Nobody has paid I me. I was working for my varsity money from literally since I started walking. Sure. <laughs> So you became a child star mm. on SABC One, your TV. How did that breakthrough come about? It was so, I mean, it's not even something crazy like they found mm. me at a mall or anything like that. Because mm. I'd remembered that I'd done TV ads and stuff like that mm. as a kid, I mm. wanted to get back on TV. So mm. my mom found me an agent. One of my first auditions was Yo TV. Thousands of kids were auditioning. Yeah. And I got the job. And that's been my career ever since. 20 years running now. Sure. You start working at the age of 10. Yeah. You start getting paid. Yeah. You have a bank account. Yes. How did you manage money? Obviously, at that time, I'm sure your parents must have, must have, must have played a yeah, part. Yeah, I didn't see that money for a very long time. Because, I mean, if you think about it as well, I'm raised by a single mom. Mm. She's got two other kids because I've got a twin brother and an older sister. Mm. And I'm starting to make money. So, if anything, it's not like this money was tucked away for me for a college fund or anything like that. If anything, I was like the second income in the home. Yeah. So for the longest time, I was actually helping my mom out. She was managing my money, yes. Mm. Making sure I've got everything I need, school and whatnot. But it was the secondary income in the house. I yeah. think only when I was about 15, 16 was when she was like, okay, you're old enough now to yeah. handle your own money. But even still, it was very controlled. I was still helping out at home. You know what it's like growing up yeah. in a middle class black South African family? you always have to contribute towards the household. And mm. I think for the longest mm. time, my money did exactly that. It's mm. not like I finished your TV and I had yeah. thousands and thousands and hundreds I of brands. I like a millionaire. Saved. No, I yeah. wish. Maybe if I'd been a Disney star in America, but absolutely not. A lot of us didn't finish your TV and we were millionaires. We work yeah. in South African television. There's no millions there. There was no millions then and there's I'm no millions million now. Anymore. No, absolutely not. And what's crazy is kids TV was so big and we had yeah. so many viewers, yeah. but the amount of money we were didn't translate to the amount of viewers and I think that's what's so sad about our industry that you could seem like you're making bank but mm. you're actually not so in as much as like it was so exciting to be these kids that are on TV and that mm. are earning money yes for a child the money I was earning was great mm. but when I look back now and I'm like yeah. I should be living off that money right now. <laughs> I should be retiring. Bo Miley sure. Cyrus in the yeah. US. Yeah. Oh, boy, that's so raven. Who were sure. you know, on the same level, but like yeah. American and global standards. Yeah. They never need to work ever again. Here I am, still working. Do you know, 20 years ago, I mean, when you started working, do you know what was your, what was your first paycheck? How much was no, it? No, I don't remember my first check, but I can imagine my rate was probably around 300 and something per show. It really wasn't that much. So I don't remember how much I was actually earning. But I think sometimes we'd walk away with five, six thousand rand or even more. But yeah. and that's what I'm saying. It's not yeah. like we were making thirty, forty, fifty thousand rand at the end of the month then. Yeah. But as the years go on, obviously you start making more money, you start doing more shows, your rate goes up a little bit. But I'm gonna tell you the truth, our rates were not that high. Have the rates changed now? Look, I can't speak for people who are who've got a television gig at the moment. Oh. I, I don't have a TV gig at the moment. I can't speak for other people. Oh. But we've always just had that 
it's just situation enough. in it's our just industry enough, where yeah. the rates are not high enough. Maybe some people are lucky enough to have really extreme high rates. I think it has gotten better in a lot of spaces. Yeah. I think as you grow older yeah. as well, and you're able to negotiate higher rates. But yeah. don't forget, a lot of people also come into the industry very fresh, very new. Yeah. They're willing to take whatever. Yeah. A lot of the times, the money you're making from television is not enough to keep yeah. you afloat. You need so many other streams of income. And that's yeah. why when people complain, oh, this one does TV, radio, voice, what, what, acting. And it's like, you kind of have to do all of that to be able to survive in yeah. a South African entertainment industry. We don't have the kind of industry where you are privileged enough to do one thing until later yeah. on in your life. Like, I'm privileged at the moment to have cut down a lot of other work because I'm fine with doing radio. Yeah. And a lot of other extra work, yes, yeah. but it takes a very long time to get to that point where you're like, I only want to focus on mm. this one thing. A lot of the times, People are raising a family. People are taking care of other extended family. There's black tax in the mix. There's no way you're making it just off one gig. I was under the impression that people who are in the public eye doing multiple gigs, they're killing it. They are. Mm. But they have to be doing multiple gigs to kill it. It's also a survival thing. I don't think everybody wants to be working 10 million jobs. Nobody wants to work that hard. Yeah. Well, I mean, it's important to work hard, but we live very hectic lives. I think everybody wants to enjoy their life and relax and get to spend time with friends and family and actually enjoy their lives. I think a lot of the times now, we're focused so much on our well-being and our mental health. I don't think somebody wants to be working to the bone seven days a week. You know yeah. what I mean? For the longest time, I work seven days a week. I think it's more of a survival thing than wanting to do it. I think if you had to speak to a lot of entertainers, if they could choose, they'd probably only choose two or three things in the beginning of your career yes you want to do everything but there's no way you want to do so many things you're probably not even good at all those things that yeah. you want to do yeah so Karabu, if you were not in broadcast what would you be doing yo i don't know because it's something that i've done all my life it's such yeah. a difficult one but i think i definitely would have probably gone into corporate, mm. maybe been an entertainment lawyer. That is something that mm. after matric I really wanted to pursue. Yeah. Uh, very passionate about education and studying. Mm. So I did my undergrad, I did a BA at WITS, I did my honors in brand strategic communications, I'm mm. about to do my masters in digital business. Mm. So there are definitely some corporate ambitions over there and that's mm. probably what I would have gotten into. But there's something about really being passionate about the work that you do that it's so hard to step out of it and do something else. So even with me collecting all these degrees, I'm still yeah. like, broadcasting, broadcasting, <laughs> it doesn't want to let go of me. You. That's I think calling. I was born with it and it's yeah. my calling and hence even now, yeah. Even if I keep on studying and that kind of stuff, I mean, I've worked nine to fives while broadcasting. So I've worked yeah. the nine to five while I was doing radio, mm. but making sure that that nine to five was in radio. Yeah. And that's another example of the work that we have to put in to be able to stay afloat. Yeah. I literally had to work a nine to five at a radio company while doing shows on weekends mm. so I can live a normal life and survive as an early 20 something year old. Yeah. So in the mix, there was a marriage proposal. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> on your 30th birthday. Yes. How long were you in a relationship before the marriage proposal? It was 12 years. So we got married when it was 12 years. So we got engaged in our 11th year, 12th year we got married, and now we've been together 13 years. So we started dating since first year of our team. Goodness. People are out there getting degrees. I was getting my degree and a husband. <laughs> sure. I think it's quite humbling though. I mean, to be in a relationship with someone for that long, Yeah and eventually um, uh, get married. Because people, three months is a long time, eh? Listen, I think also you have to consider age with this kind of stuff. I mm. mean, I think I understand being 25 and you start dating somebody and then getting married a few years after that. But when you start dating someone when you're 19, you mm. are nowhere close to being mm. ready for marriage. Mm. Getting married for, before 30 was never a plan for me as well, yeah. for him as well. We had to work, we had to save money, we had to get our lives together. Yeah. And only when we felt like our lives are together, yeah. and especially financially and emotionally, yeah. then it was like, okay, we can do this. Because you're building a career I think for him, he wanted to also be a husband that can provide for his family, take care of his family, that kind of stuff. I think also, you know, as um, growing up in the South African landscape, we have black tax, for example. Yeah. You're still taking care of home. You're still 
building a house at home and that kind of stuff. How are you going to pay Lobola, have a wedding, buy a house, that kind of stuff, when you're still busy with back home? So I think for many years, we were just trying to build our careers. And when we felt financially stable enough mm. and emotionally ready and grown, we decided to get married. And I'm so glad we mm. waited because we're not sitting here yeah. married and we don't have a place to live or yeah. we don't know what we're doing with our finances yeah. or we're still struggling so much with our careers. We're in such a comfortable place in our lives. And so I feel like that 12 year wait was worth it because yeah. it probably would have been very stressful if I got married at 25. Yeah. I probably wouldn't have even afforded the wedding of my dreams. I was able to get that. We yeah. were able to move into a beautiful home mm. that we bought before we even got married. Yeah. I remember asking the lawyers when we were signing for our, our house and I was like, is what I'm doing crazy? Like, do people buy houses with their boyfriends? Mm. And she's like, girl, this is a contract you can get out of. Yeah. <laughs> Marriage, on the other hand, mm. <laughs> that one is a lot more tricky. Mm. I was like, okay. And she was also explaining to me that a lot more couples are getting into those kind of arrangements, not necessarily rushing to get married, buying property together, investing, that mm. kind of stuff together, making sure, obviously, the legalities and that kind of stuff are in place and mm. you know what you're doing legally mm. and that you're not putting yourself in a situation or you cohabit and mm. you don't really want to get married yet the law can protect you in those kind of situations there are contracts you can sign you mm. know and so for me that's why I didn't mind buying a house with yeah. somebody who was my then boyfriend yeah we then get married and by the time we got married we had a home yeah, yeah. apart from uh, the, the decision to buy a house and when going on into a joint bond yeah did you discuss how the money issue is going to work? Yeah, we had married? to. Yeah, it was always a conversation. And I think because we also stayed together before we got married. Mm. And that's what I'm saying. Things are so differently culturally at the moment. I think our parents look at us and they're like, what are you young people doing? Yeah. Are we definitely doing things our own way? And I think it makes it such an exciting time. There's no pressure for children. There's no pressure to even get into the traditional buying a home thing. Mm. Some people are leaving it till much later in their lives. You know what I mean? Mm. Or like we went and got a property together as boyfriend and girlfriend or living together before you get married. So mm. we did that for a long time. And so already we were managing our finances in a certain way that by the time we got married, it was so easy to get into mm. that phase and that change into our relationship because we'd already been managing money together for a long time. Mm. He knows my money habits. Yeah. He knows how much I earn. Mm. He didn't get a sh the shock of his life after marrying me. Mm. I didn't get the shock of my life after marrying him. We've mm. always been very transparent about mm. our finances, our financial goals and all of that. And I think being together for so long and building our lives financially, emotionally, whatever it is, career-wise as well, has helped so much with managing our finances right now. Yeah. We know our future plans. Yeah. Yes, they're constantly changing. The economy co constantly changes. I mean, things come up, right? Mm. We're living in a time now where we have load shedding. You might have been mm. saving for something else and all of a sudden, that whatever 100K you were saving, all of a sudden you need to get an inverter and solar. Mm. <laughs> but that was meant for something else. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. So things are constantly changing and plans constantly change. And I think it's important for us to keep like yeah. going with those changes and trying to stay afloat in this very difficult economy. It's not mm. all glitter and gold like Instagram says it is mm. or like the bright and shiny lights of entertainment say it is. Yeah. We're living in the same South Africa here. Yeah. How important is it to be transparent about the money issue in, in a marriage? I mean, some people will hide their pay slip like a fidelity van. Yo, I think it's huh? infidelity to hide your money. <laughs> that is financial it's cheating. financial cheating. It's yeah. financial cheating. We yeah. have to be transparent because how are you going to help me out of a situation if you don't even know that I'm in that situation? Mm. How am I going to help you if you get into a wrong business deal that doesn't work out? Mm. I cannot help you. Yeah. So it's important to be open. I think even before getting married, you know, one of the big things that came up financially was your marriage contract. Yeah. Yes, you're getting married, you got the ring and all of that. So many people don't even know it before with Lobola, the first thing you need to see is a lawyer. Yeah. Before the uncles even come to your gate. Hmm. You have to see a lawyer and you need to sign that marriage contract before yeah. Lobola because yes. once Lobola is paid, you are married in community or property. Yes. And so it's so important for us to learn about these things so mm. we don't hurriedly get excited. Oh yes, put on the ring. Mm. Oh yes, uncles, we're getting married. And yes. then all of a sudden, you're stuck in this marriage contract you don't understand or that you didn't want, you know? Mm. I'm tempted to double click on the <laughs> on the contract thing. It's a real thing and yeah. a lot of people don't know. Girls, before mm. that uncle is at your gate, yeah. make sure 
<laughs> you have seen a lawyer because the lawyers also sit down. Yeah. They explain things to you mm. nicely about what are mm. these marriage contracts, what do they entail, what works both for you as mm. a couple. And I think that's where transparency mm. starts mm. as a couple as yeah. well, right? When you're about to now mm. get into a marriage, hopefully the transparency happened way before yeah. this point of getting married. But already being able to have that conversation, it doesn't have to be a difficult conversation. Yeah. The marriage contract thing wasn't a difficult conversation for us at all. Yeah. I mean, we are two people who invested in property already together. Mm. Yeah. <laughs> We've been living together for so long. What mm. is sitting in front of a lawyer and talking about our marriage contract? It's yeah. got to be done. Mm. And we need to also know what we're doing before we step into these arrangements. Because how many stories have you heard of things ending so badly? Lobola was paid, wasn't finished, but oh my gosh, all of a sudden this guy's taking my pension. Mm. We've seen our grandmothers go through it. We've seen our parents go through it. And I think we can do things a little bit differently. And, and mm. that is part of like managing your money, right? Yeah, Being yeah. able to, even in such a happy celebratory situation yeah. for you to understand legally where do I stand? How are things yeah. looking? And being transparent as a couple. And I think it starts way before marriage. Yeah. It starts as a couple as mm. well when you're just dating. Yeah, because I think uh, a lot of people are not aware that you know, a prenup is actually an estate planning tool. Yes. And obviously, given your circumstances, your careers, it may be an important conversation to have. I want to go back to your 20-year broadcasting career. Yes. What has been your most rewarding personal achievement? Keeping a career for that long. Yeah. Starting a career when you're so young, anything can go wrong. Yeah. This industry is so brutal. This industry will break mm. your heart. Yeah. I think you go through so many changes as a person as mm. well. Uh, there have been moments where I didn't want to do this anymore. Yeah. It's hard just mm. living in South Africa in general. I keep mentioning that because yeah. it is our reality. Mm. I think a lot of things are hard and mm. keeping a career for 20 years as a young person is mm. difficult. Yeah. It's one thing when you start working at 24, 25 and at the end of your career and you look at 20 years later and you're in your mm. 40s, 50s. Mm. That's different to somebody who started working at 10, 11 years old. I had to go through puberty mm. while working. I was in high school while working. Then there was that change into my trick. Mm. Then there was that change into my early 20s. Then my late 20s. Now into my 30s getting married. Maybe, God willing, should I have children? There's a career happening during that time too. So I mm. think having so many personal changes, but still maintaining a mm. great career, great image, yeah. um, being able to take care of myself and have a, a, a career that I'm so proud of. I think for me, that's been my, my proudest achievement because yeah. anything could have gone wrong anything <laughs> yo that sounds like a lot of hard work yeah so can you walk us through some of the let's call it a, a investment you've made in yourself in yeah. terms of your career your education your skills what type of investment have you made in yourself i think one of my favorite things about myself is the way i'm able mm. to cultivate and nurture my relationships with people mm. whether personally or professionally I think the investments that I've made in terms of my education, I'm so big on education. I think I'm going to study for the rest of my life mm. because I think it's important to continue learning. I'm such a curious person, so I always want to learn. Mm. And I also like learning in a structured environment as well. So mm. I like learning informally, yes, yeah. through travel, through reading, through talking to people. Mm. But I like learning in a structured environment. I, I even think academia is probably something I'm going to get into later on in life. I'm just going to be one of those people yeah. who are going to keep on studying. That's also been one of my proudest achievements. And I can not wait to keep on studying even further and I think the investment in my well-being mentally mm. that's been a very important one for me because if you are not well then you're pouring from an empty empty mm. cup everywhere in your personal relationships in your work relationships in your money you don't know what you're doing if yeah. you are not well so mm. I've been so intentional about taking care of my body taking care, care of my mind so whether it's seeing a therapist or going on medication if the yeah. therapist uh, or the psychiatrist says it's time for meds, babes, yeah. this anxiety of yours. Yeah. Do you know what I'm saying? Yeah. So taking care of my mental health okay. and my physical health has been a very big one for me because yeah. I can't work that hard if I'm not okay. That's true. A lot of young people struggle with prioritizing or striking a balance between passion projects yeah. and you know, securing their livelihood. How do you deal with that? It's a difficult one and I mean I'm always in a conversation with people about this because it's unfair for me to say to somebody don't follow your passion if I'm somebody that's been broadcasting all my life mm. but you followed your passion. Mm. Do you know what I mean? Mm. But sometimes we have to be realistic about certain things. Remember earlier on I was telling you about how I had a 9 to 5. Mm. That's putting 
security and being a realistic person and my passions together. Uh. I have to make a livelihood. I cannot make my livelihood through weekend radio. Yeah. I had to get a nine to five. Uh. I've got skills that I went to university for, but what did I do? I used those skills in an environment that I still love. So I still, the normal nine to five that everybody doesn't want to do, I still was able to push myself to do that. I hated it. I didn't enjoy going to the office every single day, yeah. but I learned so many valuable skills and lessons and that still made me the broadcaster I am today. Yeah. How can you find w ways to merge realistically making a living and having to survive mm. and your passions? And I don't always think that our passions need to make us money, to be quite honest. Yeah. Let's say you love baking. Mm. Does it always have to be a side hustle? I don't think so. Sometimes even pursuing our passions as a business, mm. I think sometimes sucks us dry from our passion. You, you start hating it. Because mm. now you've got 20 baking orders that you need to do mm. and you used to enjoy just doing this for your family. Yeah. So I'm not saying people shouldn't follow their passions. I think it's extremely important. Mm. But I think it's very important for us to be realistic. Do we work to live or live to work? Yeah. So it's... I want to work to live. <laughs> I don't want to live to work. I don't want to look back at the end yeah. of my life and all yeah. I did was work. I saw my grandmother do it. I'm seeing my mom yeah. now. She's close to retirement age. She's an entrepreneur. Yeah. She is one of the most amazing women I know. But seeing them have to work so yeah. hard. Yeah. And I'm not saying there's anything wrong with working hard. I want to work damn hard. I, I do and I always will. But I don't think I want to look back at the end of my life and I didn't enjoy it. Yeah. And all I did was work. You know what I mean? I want to be able to do all those things that bring me joy mm. while I work. Yeah. And it's striking that balance and finding a way to do it, right? Yeah. It's a little bit tricky. Mm. Um, but I want to look back at the end of my life and say, yeah. I worked to live. Okay. Now, travel yes. is a significant interest for you. How do you budget for your travel experiences? I wait. Mm. <laughs> you wait. <laughs> I have to wait. <laughs> Instagram yeah. will make you think people are traveling every single month, every single, you know, freaking every yeah. couple of months. But I have to wait. I have to budget. I have to save up to travel. Do you know yeah. what I mean? I think I don't put a lot of pressure on myself. That's what yeah. I do. Yeah. It is something that I love to do. It's something I enjoy doing. But I don't now put pressure on myself to travel all the time just because people are waiting for me on Instagram for my next trip yeah. or this passion of mine to travel. Is, is itching and I need to quickly travel. But I also don't think there's anything wrong with spending your money yeah. on things that you love. Yes, we have to be good with money and save and invest and all that stuff, great. And we also need to be careful about judging people and what they spend their money on. Yeah. I'm done doing that. Yeah. I'm not going to judge you for wanting to drive a fancy car. Mm. That's what you love. Maybe mm. I like clothes mm. and that's my guilty pleasure. Yeah. We all have our things that we love. And yeah. isn't that why we're working so hard to feel those passions and feel the things that we love? I don't think there's anything wrong yeah. with spoiling yourself every now and again. Because I think some people develop a very crazy relationship with money where it comes from a place of lack. Mm -hmm. I believe money flows. Yeah. Flows out and it comes back to me. Yeah. I've got that energy with money. <laughs> very good with it. Mm. I've been making money since I was 11 years old. I'm not rich. Yeah. Absolutely far from it. Mm. But I've got such a giving nature with it as well. Mm. Uh, sometimes it needs some boundaries. Yeah. <laughs> a little too kind sometimes. Yeah. Very easy on the hand. <laughs> My family and friends know. But what I'm saying is, sometimes people operate from a place of lack because maybe they grew up mm. lacking money so much. Maybe you grew up poor and you never want to go back to that place that I think they struggle to enjoy their money because they don't want to go back to that place. Mm. And I think we shouldn't always operate from a place of like, we need to enjoy our lives too. If you had the opportunity to host Ellen Musk for dinner, what would you discuss with him? What would you say? Oh, I would discuss ethics. Okay. I don't understand billionaires. Mm. I think to be a billionaire, there are a lot of unethical things you need to do. Mm -hmm. I think there are a lot of underpaid employees somewhere in the mix. There's a lot of damage to the environment that's been made to the mix. Mm. There's a lot of people, you know, helping there in the mix. Mm. And that's what I believe about billionaires. Even ones that I love, yeah. like Rihanna, for mm. example. Mm. Amazing musician that I love. Mm. There are reports somewhere about some of her staff being underpaid and things like that. Do you mm. know what I mean? Like very unethical ways of doing business. Mm. So I think if I had to host a billionaire like Elon Musk, we'd speak about ethics. I think we'd speak about the amount of money they have can solve so many problems. Not only as him being a South African and we have so many problems, but mm. I think there are a lot of problems in the world that could be solved by billionaires. That's very interesting. I would have thought maybe you would want to know how he made this money but that's so noble of you to think of 
ethics because mm -hmm. it's, it's one of the underrated subjects, yeah. especially when it comes to the super rich. Yeah. Exactly. Okay, in conclusion, if you were to give some financial tips to young people who want to get into your industry, what would that be? I think it would be get help. Mm. Get help and get it early. Not everybody in our lives is a financial advisor. There are people who are actually paid to do this. Yeah. Mom can say, this is what I did. Yeah. Yes, mom. <laughs> in her time. That was 30, 40 <laughs> years ago when property wasn't as expensive as yes. it is now. So yeah. maybe that's not the best thing that I should be yeah. spending my money on right now in my first job. Mm. Do you know what I'm saying? Mm. There are financial advisors out there. I think that's the very first thing. I would advise somebody that wants to get into the industry or is new in the industry to do. When you get into a corporate job after studying, you sit with HR and there's medical aid and they explain your provident fund and your retirement fund. There's so many things they explain to you that are already set up for you. Mm. Unfortunately, in our industry, you are on your own. Mm. You must go find your medical aid. You must go find your own provident fund, how to do that. Mm. You know what I mean? You must figure out your retirement plan. Mm. You need to figure out what happens on rainy days. So I think finding some to help you manage that this is the little that I'm earning what can I do with it to help me for the future what can mm. I do with it to help me even now as a normal working person mm. then there's obviously the issue of taxes getting somebody to handle your taxes yeah. I made a joke off air and I was talking mm. about how I've used the same tax guy mm. since I was a child I have he has taken care of my taxes since I was 11 years old mm. I've never had issues with the tax man I never will have wow. those kind of issues mm. you know what I mean Maybe because ethics, but also because I understand that, like, yeah. I didn't study this stuff. Like, yeah. finance is hard for me. You know <laughs> what I mean? It's hard. Yeah. But there are people mm. who are professionals in this. The same way we are professionals in what we do as broadcasters. Mm. There are professionals with finance. And your friends are not financial advisors. Your partner's not a financial advisor. Yeah. Your mother's not a financial advisor. Mm. At the end of the day, you get the knowledge and the advice that you need and make the decision that is best for you yeah. and like save money hmm. it also it sounds so unrealistic to say it, but Gangabo, there's no money to save the state of our economy that kind of stuff but it's the truth yeah there's so many lessons that i hmm. need to still learn i am not perfect i've made many mistakes hmm. even those financial mistakes i've hmm. made them but i think when you've made mistakes it becomes so much easier yeah. to be able to explain to somebody else how they can do better yeah. and that's why it's important for us to also speak about our failures yes. so that you can teach the next person how they can do better than you did wow Garaba, thank you so much it's an absolute pleasure thank I you really, i really thoroughly enjoyed our conversation thank you. i can tell you are a broadcast i felt like i was on radio yeah. <laughs>